good morning good afternoon and good evening to our distinguished speakers chairs and the audiences in different parts of the world this is the first webinar in the month of june and it is indeed very very special to us as you all are aware that this june the education committee of the acn has completes one year of online education through our webinar lectures for the benefit of the young neurosurgeons on achieving this feat we are extremely thankful to all our wonderful speakers and chairs who have supported us in the past a special thanks to professor yoko kato mm -hmm. the president of the acn whose relentless support has driven us thus far we are also indebted to professor shubin whose everlasting support has enabled mm -hmm. to reach out to young neurosurgeons across the border into china lastly i would like to thank you all the wonderful audiences of our webinars all over the world whose appreciation has kept us pushing for more coming back to our webinar like i said that this is a very special day for us and hence for this special occasion we are blessed with the presence of the legends of our profession from whom we are going to hear very insightful lectures and comments the first speaker for today is a very well known giant in the field of skull based surgery and it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to professor osama al mufti professor al mufti is the director of the skull based surgery program at the brigham and women's hospital harvard medical school in boston massachusetts professor al mufti's area of interest and expertise is in the field of skull based surgery he is a pioneer in this area and he has contributed to this field over 500 publications that include authoring or editing nine books and over 236 peer reviewed journal articles he is a sought after lecturer and has made over 1000 presentations and over 90 sitting professorships in national and international universities he is a dedicated <clears throat> teacher and has been a faculty member and director of over 50 workshops and hands on courses dr almafti is a member of the several surgical societies and has served in various leadership roles across the globe he was a founding member and past president of the world academy of neurological surgeons and the north american skull based society he currently serves on several editorial boards of <clears throat> medical journals he has been honored by several prestigious lectures including the first sugita memorial lecture and penfield lecturer and presented with honorary memberships in skull base and neurosurgical societies abroad he was recently awarded the olive krona medal and magnus medal of, for recognition of his outstanding contributions to the neurosurgical field mm -hmm. he was also decorated with the cushing medal of excellence and innovation and the medal of honor of the world federation of neurological surgeons we are extremely honored and thankful to mm -hmm. professor almafti for accepting our invitation to base mm -hmm. our webinars today is going to talk about the topic titled the surge of high grade meningiomas the second speaker for today's session needs no introduction to he is the person who changed the skull with surgery forever the approach that he described in his name went on to become workhouse of neurosurgery in approaching lesions involving the middle and posterior fossa ladies and gentlemen it's my great honor to introduce you to professor takeshi kawase from japan professor kawase presently is a honorary professor department of neurosurgery <laughs> School of Medicine, Kyoto University. He is also the honorary professor at the Shuzhou University, China, and honorary president of the WFNS. He was the previous guest professor at the University of Utah, University of Cincinnati, and UCSF. <laughs> professor Kawase excels in the field of skull base surgery and has published several manuscripts in this regard. He has adorned several academic and non-academic posts in his vast career in neurosurgery, including being the president of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. president of japanese skull base society and president of asia oceanic skull base society <laughs> and first president of the world academy of neurological <clears throat> surgery he has been awarded several medals of honors in his illustrious career namely the nehru stroke prize and international prize of jns and dandy medal we are indeed grateful to him for accepting an invitation to be speaker at our webinars today he is going to talk about tumors of the governor sinus indications for surgery and how can we achieve the best results <laughs> the chair for the first session of today is one of the most fa famous faces of japanese neurosurgery professor shigeaki kobe Professor Kobayashi is the professor emeritus of the Shinshu University. He currently serves as the honorary director of the Stroke and Brain Center, Aizawa Hospital, Matsumoto, Japan. Professor Kobayashi is the president of the prestigious Rotten Society. He was the past president of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society. He was a treasurer, second vice president, and honorary president of the WFNS. His illustrious career is studded with awards and recognitions that he has received across the globe. His field of professional interest includes cerebrovascular surgery, brain tumor surgery, neurosurgical instruments, robotics, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Kobayashi for accepting our invitation to chair today's first session of webinar. The chair for the second session of today is a star skull base surgeon in the modern neurosurgery world. It is my great honor to introduce you to Professor Luis Borba from Brazil. Professor Borba is the professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Evangelic Medical School, Curitiba, Federal University of Paraná, Brazil. <coughs> He is also the professor honoris causa Sechino Medical School Moscow Russian Federation who was the past president of the Brazilian Neurosurgical Society and is the president of the World Skull Base Society's upcoming meeting in Rio de Janeiro Brazil 2022 we are extremely honored to have his presence in our webinars today and sincerely thank him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of our webinars 
on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kato i would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of acns webinars dr lubun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction i would like to hand over this platform to professor kobayashi thank you very much uh, dr raja uh very nice introduction already made uh, for professor nefty i don't have to say more but uh, except that i we've been good friend for more than 40 years and i have always been impressed by his lecture and his uh, <clears throat> great incentive to do work and inventing many things and very informative lectures always. And more than anything else, I've been very much honored to be friends with him. And we'd like to welcome now Professor Almefti. His title is The Surge of High-Grade Meningioma. Sam, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you and good morning. And what a great pleasure and honor to have you all in here. And you're my moderator. I'm going to start, summarize all my talk in the beginning in two lively examples. Uh, this patient had a obviously false meningioma. It got operated and resected, good resection, but they left something for the safety uh, on the fox and the sagittal sinus to have a safe surgery. Now, you are not surprised that reoccurred, and now the recurrence got the proton beam radiation and then reoccurred again, and now he gets resection and more radiation. And then reoccurred again, and then they get more resection and the trial of medication. And now he's a grade two meningioma. <clears throat> and then he will reoccur again and get more surgery and more brachytherapy and more medical therapy. And uh, eventually, he will keep reoccurring and pass away. Now, <clears throat> falsine meningiomas do extend in the fox. <clears throat> so if you really want them not to come back, you have to resect the fox. We call that grade zero resection. And <clears throat> We address that uh, in this paper, but that's not what I want to say. Resection will make you cured and will avoid that course you have just seen with the other patient, 10 years. But how you're going to resect the fox and those big bridging vital veins on the way that you will risk the patient life. And that's what this whole presentation is. There is something called microsurgery. Microsurgery could be a small maneuver or could be a major maneuver but you need to be trained with microsurgery. Yes, you could resect the whole fox without to injure the bridging vein. If you follow what Professor Kobayashi or the Professor Sugita wrote 40 years ago, simple maneuver, it saved life, it give you the ability to resect but it needs a training. Here we go, you. Shigi, thank you for writing that. I've been using it for 40 years. I think it saves so many patients' life and function. 
the simple microsurgical techniques, but require a training in microsurgery. Once you separate that vein from the cortex, the tumor all exposed, you could do whatever you want because the cortex will relax away. <clears throat> because we are not trained in this micro neurosurgery, now all what you hear give radiation. Here, Stanford, Mayo Clinic. Um, New York University, gamma knife, cyber knife, proton beam, everything. And we've been living the last 10 or 15 years under this, that you do for meningioma, aggressive surgery. I don't know what aggressive surgery, not removing it, what, what it says. <laughs> there, there, there is a residual and then you give to the residual focal radiation because you want to preserve function. And it carried even more that you were in advance, you plan not to remove the whole tumor and you outline a part that you remove it surgically and leave the other part in advance, before you go to the operation, before you know what you can or you cannot do to give it radiation. And all of that is sold under, we manage the complexity so you can focus on what matters. What you focus on is just to bring the patient because the radiation therapist or the machine is going to do the tough cases. And that's the selling point. You don't need to be trained. You don't need to have a skill. You don't need to have anything. You just need to sign the paper of the physics and push the button. Anybody can do it. And, and this has happened before. Uh, you know, back when they first have machine, they said machine could take the hair from the body. So all of those women rushed to have a beautiful body and got radiation treatment. Not knowing that they're going to pay a very big price for the radiation they receive. So here, what this and want to say and have said, radiation therapy administered to treat residual meningioma has failed. We are seeing increasing number of patients who have been treated in various centers around the world with subtotal removal and radiosurgery who are now disparate. They have undergone multiple surgery and radiosurgery only for the tumor to grow faster and to transform to a higher pathological grade. The result is a long course of accumulated morbidity, agony, expenses for palliative management, while the chance for a cure is lost because of the failure to attempt to achieve total surgical removal the first time. Very few of us seen malignant meningioma in the past, but how many seen it this year? I bet you everybody listening said they saw malignant meningioma last year. It used to be less than 1%. Now my practice, more than half of it is high-grade meningiomas. 
where did they all come from? How could you understand what is malignancy in meningiomas? You want to know that meningioma has faith, which is the histology, and has a soul, which is the genetic making of the meningiomas. And if the faith is pretty and the gene is good, you have benign meningioma. If you have alteration in the gene, then you have a malignant meningioma, even if the face was the face was pretty. How do you get alteration in the malignant meningioma or the high grade meningioma? The chromosome instability. So you start to see deletion and you start to see transformation. So even if the meningioma look benign in histology, its behavior might be malignant. So malignancy in meningioma and not the histology. It's the behavior. If you want to take that definition of malignant meningioma, we went back and looked into 170 patients who will confirm to this definition that their meningioma with initial or progressive malignant course toward fatal outcome. And turn out to be that those are two diff three different groups. Group one, they were malignant from day one, do novo. Group two, radiation-induced meningioma. Group three, which is the larger number nowadays, is the transformed meningioma. That means they were absolutely benign and became horribly malignant. The de novo is easy. From day one, like this one, papillary meningioma, it's the ugly face. And if you look into the genetic, already has 1P and 14Q and 8 and 6. These are de novo, God made malignant meningiomas. They are the rhabdoid meningioma, the papillary meningioma, and the anaplastic meningiomas. They have a messed up gene, which is mainly in the 1P, 14Q, and the 8 and 10 and 6 come in. They are like every cancer. The survival is about two and a half years and they fail just about every treatment. Major radical surgery is must in them, then radiation therapy, then there might be a trial and protocol for any medical therapy we might get. There is so many medical therapy now have been tried, but none has a proven effective. These are just the list of the current protocol for immune therapy or chemotherapy or uh, hormonal therapy in uh, meningiomas. So far, nothing works, but we should find one because surgery and radiation is not the answer educate for high-grade meningiomas. However, with this, many meningioma patients, benign meningioma patients are seen now up front in, by the oncologist and totally bypassing the neurosurgeon. So there is a lot of people with meningioma can be and need surgery 
are not receiving it and going automatically to radiation or medical treatment. Meningioma is a surgical disease and we need to hold on those patients for their best care. That's a group one. A group two is this one. What this one? A patient has a uh, cranial pharyngioma, received radiation, and now you could see in the area of the cavernous sinus a radiation induced meningioma. They come after latency periods of time. They are different than the original tumor, and they are in the field of radiation. That's the CAHAN criteria for radiation induced malignancy. Uh, how much radiation you need? Very little, 1.5 gray. Anybody receive 1.5 gray has 10 times higher chances to have radiation than the patient or the person who did not receive it. That's all what it takes, 1.5 gray. Everybody got gamma knife for an acoustic, let's say, got more than four or five gray to many places around the tumor. So the young people, um, I don't know if you're gonna be happy or miserable. All of these acoustics got radiated now 50,000 every year. In 15, 20 years, they're gonna have a recurrent acoustic and the meningioma for you to take out. A, uh, the high dose, it create meningioma faster, shorter period of time. What those radiation induced meningioma like this patient, you know, he's been radiated for pituitary, 10 years later got the huge meningioma, resected, came back, Resected, came back, resected, came back, resected, giving gamma knife, came back, giving uh, interferon, came back, it's now growing in other places, now it's atypical, now it come back again, now it goes out his eyes, now it goes out his face and nose, now it's a frank out malignant, and five years of continuous surgery and surgery get more and more aggressive here. The whole quarter of the head taken out with the free flap, but they died. And if you look at those patients, they started with normal gene and then they got continuous evolution of adding mutation and becoming more malignant. Radiation induced meningioma is a horrible disease. 100% recurrence if you follow them long enough. From the beginning had a bad pathology and it gets worse as you go. From the beginning they had altered genes and they add additional mutation. A very sad disease. You see them on those kids who had leukemia in a childhood or midloblastoma. They lived 15, 20 years, and now they're struggling with this other horrible malignant disease, radiation-induced meningioma. It doesn't say what the pathologists say. All the pathologists say the grade one, they're malignant. Now, radiation-induced meningioma is multiple. You take one out, another one will come out. Another one, two other one will come. One will grow, one does not grow. So the management of radiation-induced meningioma should be thoughtful for the rest of the life of this patient. And that's the one I want to talk to you about. All of that was introduction to put things aside. A meningioma was a truly benign 
faith and gene and became converted to a really malignant and ended with death. Malignant transformation of meningioma is real and Dr. Kadri and I proved it a long time ago with this article. But there is different type of uh, malignant transformed meningioma. There is meningioma from the beginning. It has very benign, pretty grade one face. But from the very beginning, they had a bad soul. They have already changed in the gene. Here an example of it, a patient on first operation was grade one. Second operation became a grade two. Third operation became frank out malignant to grade three. But in the first operation and then the second operation in the third operation from the beginning, he had 1P14 Q changes. So these are what I call them wolf in the skin of sheep. And we should know them from the beginning. And that's why a genetic analysis of meningioma I've been doing for 30 years and should be done on every meningioma. Now, then you get this other one. In the beginning was good gene. And then as we go in, it add mutation. And as it add mutation, it become more malignant. Those are what I call the lucis naturi. It's monster. It's a freak of nature. It's mangled, wrapped, deformed. These are mutant swarm made by us. Example, clonoid meningioma got very good operation, a gross total removal with one exception. The base of the tumor was not resected. So it came back, small as you see, observed, got a little bigger, got radiation, got bigger, got somatostancing, got bigger, got radiation again, got bigger, got operation, got bigger, became malignant, it got everywhere, surgery, radiation, medicine, died. At the last but genetic, there is lots of CDKN2A. This is a gene known for malignant transformation. Wasn't there, it came in. Here's an example. A incidental meningioma in, in the back of the coronal sinus. Well, they thought a year later that maybe got a little bigger, I don't know. So it got radio surgery. It shrinks. What a, what a victory. Just to start to grow fast. We don't do meningioma surgery in the cavernous sinus because it's too dangerous. We just do partial resection. So they got partial resection, stroke out anyhow got more radiation over it, started every medicine treatment in the world, start to get bigger, got additional radiation, came down in the spine, came down everywhere. 13 years later to the exact died from progression of meningioma. And if you look at this old article, it's super article, if you look at the survival curve of meningioma, you will find out that half of the meningioma who received gamma knife expected to die in 12 years. 
half of them dead in the 12 years or 13 years, exactly like this patient. Would they die off in 13 years? Two thirds of them from progression of the meningioma. So this doctrine is correct, that if you create instability in the chromosome and add the mutation, you will have a malignant progression. And that's exactly what radiation does. It to break the DNA, it become unstable, it will change, it will add mutation, and it will become malignant meningioma. And that's what we see every time we have analyzed those genes. They're adding mutation. So in summary, in 1969, Zolstrait meningioma increased malignancy. In 2010, after we all know so good molecular biology, we found out that radiation enrich the tumor cell of meningioma. So what we're doing, we're making a wolf out of a sheep. And when you look at those transformed malignant meningioma and compare them with the de novo, they have a lot more genetic changes. They have a lot worse outcome. And they're worse than the nature malignant meningioma. Knowing all of that, what you find that some meningiomas are written only for radiation. I think we need to stop radiating meningiomas. So what to do? What Busey said. Meningioma are benign tumor. If they are completely removed, they do not recur. Simpson proved it, and every article since has confirmed it. If you get the grade one, that's it, they're cured. But then they say, look at this, this deep seated, dangerous. You know, this is a perfect target. <coughs> for radiation. Well, this is perfect target for surgery. You debulk it. I mean, you devascularize and amputate it and you free it. and take it out. That's not the horrible, morbid, uh, and you just excise the tentorium that it came out from. You gotta eliminate the meningioma. Uh, here an example, even if in a grade two, grade two need more elimination than a grade one. Clonoidal meningiomas, <clears throat> you expose them, devascularize them, debulk them, separate them from the brain, and then this is the real operation now. This is the insertion of the dura. All of that need to be excised. The bone, the in, 
need to be removed. The whole anterior clonoid invaded by meningioma need to be removed. Any suspicious bone need to be drilled away. Optic canal is open, tumor removed from the optic canal. Additional dura margin is excised. Lateral wall of the cavernous sinus is excised. That's grade one. That will keep this lady without recurrence for 10 years. These meningioma need a grade one removal because a grade one removal provide a cure and the cure is diamond last forever. In convexity, you could do more than a grade one. There is those a small satellite meningiomas uh, uh, proven around the tumor. You could add a margin. We call that a grade zero. But how do you do that where the sagittal sinus involved? If the whole sinus is involved, the three wall and it's still open, if it's secluded, you take it out. You, you just, the uh, veins, if, if it's open, then you reconstruct it with vein graft. How about in the base? Well, that's where the trouble. On the base, oh my golly, I have Kawase here, I have Kobayashi here, I have Borba here. You use one of the skull base approaches. If, if you want to remove a grade one skull base meningioma, you need a skull base approach. Keyhole and minimally invasive and eyebrow incision and suboccipital, what have you, would not allow you to remove totally a uh, petroclimal meningioma. You could choose any one of the skull base highway to remove it. Here is one. This one still have a good hearing. So it got what we call a combined petrosal, anterior petrosal and posterior petrosal. You, you could see finding the third nerve, separating the tumor from the brainstem, raising the tumor of the posterior cerebral from the fifth nerve, follow into the cavernous sinus, V2, V3, inside cavernous carotid, sixth nerve inside the cavernous sinus, cross the midline behind the dorsum cella, the next other side, sixth nerve, and the basilar artery moved all the way to the other side. It's gone. It is a grade one. You could do grade one. And uh, we, as a matter of fact, we don't call them Simpson a grade one. We go by Kobayashi modification of the skull base uh, grading. And I tell everybody go and read that. I told you, Shige, this is dedicated to you because you all have given so great contribution. Now, or the bone, yes, in the skull base, you could remove the invaded bone here under the meatus, above the meatus, above the fifth nerve on the dorsum cella, you drill all of that invaded bone. If you do that, they do not recur. Look at that My Kaplan Meyer of a grade zero removal or grade one removal, no recurrence. And if you do that, you do not give them bad quality of life. You give them the best life with the quality because that's a better way to preserve the cranial nerve function. You're not banging on them from a small exposure. <clears throat> and you could do that in 76% of the cases. 
There was early trouble. You could see them, three of them, temporal lobe, venous infarct, intraventricular repeated hemorrhage, mainly veins, and we learn how to preserve veins. So what's the secret then? Is like this. Meningioma need intraarachnoidal dissection. You gotta tease one arachnoid plane from the other and keep all the vessel, the perforator, the capillary, the nerve intact behind the other arachnoid plane. Microsurgeon Spider-Man is gone. She's fine. She's good. The last example is this. The optic nerve gets involved so much with the tumor. You got to open the optic canal. It doesn't matter if it's a, a clonoidal meningioma or sphenoid meningioma or tuberculum cell meningioma. Once you open the optic canal, you find the tumor there and you remove it, and that's the secret in improving vision. These people do not need radiation. These people get hurt by radiation. Even with the impossible meningioma, the optic sheet meningioma, that everybody said, do not touch them surgically, they're only radiation. That's not true. They, like all the other tumor, come from the meningioma, uh, from the dura. There is a plane of dissection in the beginning between them and the optic nerve. As they grow, then the plane will disappear and the tumor might invade the nerve proper. So if you get them early, open the optic canal, you could separate it with arachnoidal dissection from the optic nerve. And that will improve their vision, not worsen it. About two thirds of the time, the vision will improve. A conclusion? As is true in all other intracranial tumor and early diagnosis, simplify the operative procedure, reduce its danger, and afford the patient the best chance of life and preservation of function. Who said that? Dandy, 100 years ago. And we're doubting this today. So I tell you to avoid malignancy, to avoid those lucis naturi, the uh, horrible monster freak. There is one modality to treat with uh, meningioma is surgery. One time is the first time. One resection mm -hmm. is Simpson grade one. One route is cranial and do no harm, take all the meningioma out, learn the skill, <clears throat> but give time. And people <clears throat> accept it. People want to cure and they're willing to take the risk. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mesky. Great, very impressive as always. And I would like to welcome some of the uh, question or panelists, uh, whatever they want to say. Is it easy uh, one? What? You always ask a tougher question. Ask me no, easy no, no. It's a very <laughs> simple question. Professor, it was a wonderful lecture. My one question to you correctly told meningioma has only one form of treatment. That is surgery. And if possible, and only you should do grade one or grade zero, whatever Simpson. Remove it. But my question to you is: You have told that, irrespective of histology, 
say you have that uh, meningiomas which show 1P14Q changes. They are bad from the beginning. And we are sure that they are going to uh, transform to malignancy. And uh, what is your uh, suggestion for that? Every time, you know, it will recur, it will turn malignant. Every time it turns malignant, you will keep on operating. Or what you are telling is if we do, say, one Simpson, one resection, they won't recur at all. The ones which are bad from the beginning, uh, that meningioma or in that group of meningioma, after how many recurrences you can suggest the radiation? Yeah, a very good question. And the, uh, uh, number one, if you felt that you got a real good grade one resection, so the only thing this information, it give you a prognosis that these meningiomas, uh, you gotta worry about them. And that's why the follow up will be shorter and closer than other meningioma. Usually for normal meningioma, I get an MRI every year and I get it for 30 years. <laughs> okay, May, make it after 10 years, every two years or every three years. But for those patients, I get in the beginning every six months. Okay. So what it affect the management is a closer follow up with, you, you got the warning that uh, you have to be careful with this patient. And I tell the patient, hey, listen, your tumor look benign, but on the gene, it look like worrisome. So we wanna observe you and monitor you closer. Sam, can, can I make a comment, Sam? Yes, Professor, I think they're welcome. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, what, uh, you know, you are inspiration and you are the king of uh, meningioma in particular, there is no question. You have been teaching us, you have been teaching the world, and you have been, you are you. Now, the thing is, if I understand right, one thing that you say is when you see a meningioma resected and resected completely and beautifully, that is one thing. Second thing is, you know, second thing which you said, if there, I am asking you one thing. One, there is a benign meningioma, which you said, good, beautiful meningioma. And you have attempted radical, beautiful resection, but by mistake or by, by, by some, that you have left some tumor behind. Then what you do, whether I agree completely, what you said is complete for me. I'm not saying that what you said is avoid radiation till you, your knife can reach. Avoid radiation till you can resect it completely. And if it recurs, resect it again. And if it recurs, resect it again. And if your knife, if you think that your knife cannot reach now, then what? So there are two questions in the way. One is resect completely. By mistake, you have left some behind. What you will do? I will follow what you are saying absolutely, that you can wait and you can observe or you can uh, you know, if it recurs, resect it again, if your knife can reach properly. And if it recurs, you again resect if your knife can reach properly. But if you yourself think that your knife is a little bit dangerous and you may not be able to reach, then you like to probably give radiation. So there are two, three mixed questions in this, Sam. I would like to have and your the, opinion. There is a third category I run into. I, I, I have those patients you just talk about and there is a third type I have maybe even more frequent and that is I go with the attempt to make total removal but I find during the operation is so stuck to the carotid artery I can't or so stuck to the brain stem I can't and I will have to accept knowingly uh, subtotal removal so that's the third category yeah what happens to me so all of those are three categories uh now don't uh, misunderstand me a uh, radio surgery 
or radiation, it's a beautiful modality in, in our, 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 our material. I'm not saying never use it. I'm saying be careful of not to abuse its use. Now, the first patient which I go in, try to remove everything, but I find out that I can't and I have to re remove a piece, I follow them. If in the future has grown, I will then give them the radiosurgery. The second patient who is, I uh, removed it, I thought I removed everything, but then I got the MRI and there is a piece I overlooked, okay? I followed them up. Now, if those were benign and came back and start to grow, I will operate again. The third patient, you removed, it came back, you removed, it came back, you removed, and then that will get radiation too. Okay, so I'm not saying you never use radiation. I'm just saying there is a selected patient with need radiation. The thing is, okay. Sam. So yeah. not every meningioma can be removed, and not every meningioma removed uh, totally, and not every meningioma removed does not come back. And there is certainly a role of radiation on those patients that cannot be totally removed or it came back. Another thing, Sam, that you said beautifully and absolutely fantastically, you said that meningiomas, you know, the radiation will act on the DNA activity. And if it is, if it is active, if the, it has worked, it will change the DNA activity and there will be a malignant potential means the DNA will become abnormal and the tumor might become malignant if not in five years till 58 years you said so there is a very high chance of it becoming malignancy so in a lieu of curing or reducing the size you increase the potential of malignant potential in almost 100% of cases, that, that is what you said. So that is a fantastic message that you have given. I think um, it has to be heard very loudly and very clearly. And I have a, only a person like you can give this message. If anybody else gives this message, they can be, you know, they will can be bombarded. But what message you have given is the truth. <laughs> Uh, everybody else might be bombarded, but I am going to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Really loved, and I wanted to hear this. I wanted to hear, and I had a big appointment today, but I left all that to hear you. Sam, thank you very much for your great lecture, which will have beautifully impact on the future of management of meningiomas. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Atul. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to ask question? I have some more time. Right. Yes, Dr. Kawasaki. Yeah, uh, um, I have the similar surgical principle to our lefty, but in some cases, uh, the uh, some case of uh, meningioma, very difficult to remove uh, by grade one. One example is a primary cavernal sinus meningioma. Would you operate, uh, still operate, and uh, uh, by finishing grade one surgery, uh, would you operate uh, the primary cavernal sinus meningioma? I'm uh, gonna wait and hear the wisdom from you and from Professor Borba. So I will leave that question to your <laughs> presentation. <laughs> yes, we can hear it from Professor Borba. Would you like to answer that, Professor Borba? Maybe Professor Kawazi can answer later. But I want to uh, bring one more uh, issue in this meningioma. What you are seeing, Professor, that the patients come to you completely scared. Somebody told them that they have severe morbidity, 
they will die, the tumor will be close to the ICA, will be impossible to remove, then it's safe to do a woodpecker surgery, <clears throat> not partial removal, they do woodpecker, just bite a little bit and burn. This change is lack of knowledge. This change is the environment today to, to do medicine, that the patient is not the first to be benefit. There is another issues, maybe the safety of the doctor. See, we are, we are leaving the patient alone, you are treating, make business or forgetting what you are learned to do, to be a doctor, to do the best for the patient. Dr. Mefti, the natural history of this, some of these small tumors is not more benign than any kind of treatment. And we see today that the patient needs some treatment. Independently, she has something in the head, let's burn. There is something in the head, let's do surgery. Sometimes take a, a glass of coffee and wait will be the best for some patient like that. I don't know what to say about the, the, the environment today in, in the, to treat this kind of tumor. I know that the, the patient is coming to you, passed for many, many doctors before. And all of them say, man, don't do surgery. It'd be very difficult, impossible to do. You die in surgery. How you convince the patient to tell, or you just tell the truth? <laughs> Sir. I, I could cry, Borba. I could <clears throat> cry for those patients because they, some of them already so brainwashed that they don't hear what you're saying. Once you tell them uh, a uh, an operation, they already uh, turned off. Uh, they're scared. They're uh, being horrified from anybody to cut them. I, I I think this is not a question to the patient. This is a question to our colleague in neurosurgery. This is a question to the people who's putting a program for the Congresses and the ANS and the World Federation and the seminars. That's all what they're teaching. I, I think that's where the problem, the problem is not with the patient, the patient already a victim of being uh, horrified. And, and it's, uh, to tell you the honest truth, uh, it's a very hard, to change the patient's mind. They came to you, they're not expecting to hear what you said. So they plug their ear and they go. Because they hear this thousand times, like you say, it's dangerous, it's gonna be paralyzed, it's gonna die, it's gonna leak, it's gonna you know, double vision, it's gonna go blind. They read it on every uh, website in all the big center around the world. They saw one surgeon, two surgeons, three surgeons. So whatever you say, they, you're not gonna reach them. Very few patients, I think, in the category you described and they are common now. You know, patients became more sophisticated so they, get on the line, they go and see this one and they go see this one. I think the problem is not in the patient or in meningioma. The problem is in the neurosurgeon's training and uh, more or less, uh, you know, it's marketing. Everybody want to bring the patients. Uh, so you need a gimmick and it's a very concerning. Thank you, thank you so much. I think well, well, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else want to say something? Uh, I think we can go to the next lecture after hearing your expert comments. Okay, I have one question I'd like to ask this Sam. It'll be okay. Uh, Dr. Almefti, on behalf of 
uh, many of the audience have like to ask one question. Uh, I agree with your policy and I agree with what you said, and I uh, trust your philosophy, surgery for meningioma. And you said you talk with the patient many times and recommend any whatever necessary to be done surgically. And in your practice, however, in actual uh, situation, do you have, uh, if you have a patient to see uh, meningioma preoperatively, uh, do you consult with the uh, radiologist? I am sure you have a good radiologist, radiotherapist, I mean. Uh, you don't ask radiologists to come in to uh, talk to each other. How do you do an actual patient? A, How do you mean in Joma? Uh, we're talking about a, a virgin patient. Virgin patient, yeah. Come in with meningiomas. Right. I spend a lot of time with them. I uh, tell them uh, the options they have. Many of them might be just observation, not do anything. I do tell them in detail about how often and popular radiation therapy there. And I tell them about the radiation being a uh, radio surgery or a fractionated. And I tell them that there is uh, this expert and this expert and this expert around, they could seek their opinion and regard radiation. But I then make it very clear of what my recommendation and why. Uh, the, and uh, tell them in detail what to expect from surgery and what it meant of surgery and what uh, I do in surgery. Now, and recommend to them surgery. There is a one uh, thing that is a, uh, the, the patient need to understand from you what you are recommending. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the patient need to understand that radiation is controlled. It's a in meningioma, it's a 10 years, maybe 12 years. And they're gonna have to deal with the, the failure or out of control of the radiation 10 years from later. So if they were uh, 40 years of age or 50 years, uh, they have to consider that very well because the radiation therapy, they do not tell them that this is for control. They tell them we're gonna treat you. All the patient with meningioma who's coming and going to radiation, they're thinking that it's equivalent in purpose of what you're offering in surgery. They think that this is the treatment. They don't know that this is a temporizing that this is a, a control, nor they know that they will come out of control in meningioma, a certain decline year after year. They do not know that whatsoever and I make that clear for them that the purpose of radiation is totally different than the purpose <laughs> of surgery. One is to get rid of the tumor if we can, the other to try to control it for as long as we can. And I think that at least the radiation therapist or the surgeon who's giving radiation should tell the patient, they don't. They tell them we're gonna treat you. They should tell them that we're gonna try to control the tumor with radiation. And that control is time limit. And there is a people who will fail control. They just caught them 99%. That's the first two years. So yes, and I will send them if they have any question to the, the most advocate <clears throat> of radiation therapists, let them go and hear it. 
Thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate that we learned a lot may, today. May, may I say yes. just one second, Professor? Oh, oh, yes, Luis, yeah. Just 30 seconds. Justin, I had the great opportunity to, to see Dr. Omef talk with the patient. Dr. Omefti, he spent more than one hour with the patient. If you sit beside him, you don't need to study more meningioma. <laughs> you tell all the issues that's possible to the patient. And after this hour of conversation, we that are just looking like a master in meningioma not to what we're seeing what he was talking with the patient. And Dr. Mercy, I will say that he spent one day of his, his life to save the life of the patient. I wanna add something here. He gave one day of his life in surgery in one or more hour of his life to explain the patient housing. In this relation between patient and doctor is the old ways. You see now the younger res resident and medical student that's there, see the x-ray surgery, show the MRI surgery, you need to do surgery. And they're all the ways you sit with the patient, they explain everything, they trust you. You have to bring this back again, the relation between doctor and patient is our main goal. Just mm -hmm. From the heart, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Luis, are you okay now? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Professor Mefti, again. On behalf of all the audience, I appreciate you. We learned a lot. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Louis. I'm running down to turn the computer in the OR, so it will be. I missed the first two minutes of your presentation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I would like to go back to our second chair, Professor Luis Boba, to say a few words of introduction and invite, invite Professor Cavazzo for his lecture. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, Brazil in Latin America. It's one of the greatest honors of my life to stay here today in front of Professor Almefti, Professor Kawazi, Professor Kobayashi, our great Professor Tugo that bringing the real neurosurgery life. And I know that a lot of people will today watching live, but in recording in YouTube, thousands of neurosurgeons, resident and medical students, you see this and watch this webinar. How can I say about Professor Kawazi? I say the Professor Kawazi was the man that changed the history of skull base. And why you think, why nobody had the idea many years ago to remove the, the, the Petros apex and to reach the Petros area? You know why? The great idea, the greatest idea coming for simple things. And the man that find the great ideas, the great thing in simple things, makes the difference. And Professor Kawazi makes wow. the difference for us neurosurgeons and for thousands of patients <clears throat> around the world that use him with technique. I, said, I don't know what you can say more. <laughs> if, if you say about your CV, I spend more time to, to say, <laughs> remind to do it in your lecture. And thank you, Professor, and thank you all the teaching and all things to all of us around the whole world. Thank you, sir, please go ahead. Thank you, Thank you for your great introduction to me. Yeah. I, I remind of the uh, very uh, happy time with you uh, in my country and in, in Brazil. So, uh, so uh, today's my topic is uh, the cavernal sinus surgery but the uh, uh, indication is very important. So I'll talk about that. So the, uh, I'll talk about the surgical indication, anatomy, 
and how to achieve the best surgery uh, based on the meningeal uh, structures. In this slide, uh, there are four types of tumors. But uh, what kind of tumors? Uh, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Each one is a completely different uh, pathology. So uh, this one is noinoma, ashwanoma, and this one is cordoma, uh, dumbbell type uh, paracera cordoma. And this one is a hemangioma. And this is a meningioma. So uh, they have a different meningeal spaces. For example, the noinoma are uh, uh, located in the interdural space. This is a uh, meningeal dura, and this is a uh, broad line is a uh, periosteal dura. So uh, the tumor located in the interdural space and is surrounded by inner layer, uh, this dotted lines in the layer. However, the cordoma located in the epidural space outside of the uh, periosteal layer. And hemangioma locate in, in, inside the cover sinus, Epi, uh, interdural space, but the inside the cover sinus. And the meningioma located uh, sometimes inside the cover sinus, but mostly in the subdural. Uh, space. So uh, sometimes the cardinal sinus meningioma extended in, into the subdural space. So uh, the surgical methods are different in each tumors. So the dura is the strongest uh, protector uh, of the brain. So Please study the meningeal anatomy and preserve meningeal layers as far as possible. That means the true minimal invasive surgery for the paracellar tumors. The minimal invasive surgery is not a cosmetic one, but uh, uh, how to preserve meningeal layer. So this is the anatomy of meningeal layer uh, in the paracera uh, spaces. So this is a periosteal layer, and uh, this is a, a break line is a meninge, uh, meningeal uh, dura. So uh, the cavernal sinus is separated by by the cranial nerves, and the cranial nerves are wrapped with so-called inner layer. So the inner layer separate the cavernal sinus and the cranial nerves. So preservation of inner layer is very, very important to preserve the cranial nerves. However, the, only the abducens nerve causes inside the cavernal sinus. So this inner layer uh, this, this is the distribution of inner layer that covers uh, uh, trigeminal nerve, third nerve, and the fourth nerve. And uh, uh, it is lost in, in, in inside the metal cave because this is a, a subarachnoid space. And uh, uh, this is one example of Paracera meningioma invaded only the lateral wall. So this uh, uh, so uh, coronal section is very important to know it because uh, the tumor invade the lateral wall of the cavernal sinus, but not inside the cavernal sinus because carotid artery deviated medially. So this is the surgical method. The 
clinoid approach was uh, made uh, to this tumor. So the anterior clinoid process was removed uh, and the optic canal was open. By this method, the attached dura was freed from the bone. So the, by cutting the dura with the tumor, it was possible to remove the tumor by grade one surgery, as our uh, uh, is told. So uh, under the uh, lateral wall of the dura, you can find the inner layer inside. The inner layer covers the third nerve and the fourth nerve and the V1. So by preservation of inner layer, no injury to the cranial nerves. Between dura and inner layer, it is not adherent. Very easy to separate. So this is the after surgery, total removed by crinoid approach without any complication. So this is a different uh, case uh, of petrochrival benjoma invading macro cave. And the macro cave is located uh, <coughs> posterior to the cavernous sinus. So this space is not the uh, cavernous sinus, but uh, subarachnoid space. And the macro cave is uh, covered by tentorium tentorium uh, superiorly, and the orifice is uh, so uh, covered by uh, petrochrinoid ligament, so-called Gruber's ligament. So by cutting uh, tentorium and Gruber's ligament, you can open the macular cave very easily by the anterior uh, petrosal approach. So this is the macular cave. And uh, the, uh, so uh, the Gruber's ligament was already uh, detached here. So this is the orifice of Merkel cave. And you can access to the Merkel cave easy, very easily by this approach. So even if the tumor invade into the Merkel cave, this is the orifice, the Macular cave can be opened by this approach, and grade one surgery was possible. So the tumor was removed with a tentorium. So the uh, and the, uh, this is a macular cave already opened. So the tumor was gone with a with the uh, with, uh, uh, meningioma. So uh, tumor was removed with the attached tentorium. So uh, grade one surgery was possible. However, this is a different uh, meningioma. The primary cavernous sinus meningioma, as, uh, as I uh, asked to uh, Osama. So, This patient was operated in 1995, long, long years ago. Please note the carotid artery here and the lateral wall is uh, encased by, by the tumor. So the tumor origin was the cavernous sinus and extended subdurally. So we are we were very active for cavernous sinus surgery 20 years ago. So uh, th this is, uh, uh, we uh, invented uh, a lot of surgical approach, posterior or uh, clinoid approach, transzymotic approach, and transpetrosal approach. So uh, we were very active because the gamma knife was not so uh, uh, widely distributed. So 
but I found in such a meningioma, the tumor adherent severely uh, with, with the cranial nerves and carotid artery. The uh, nature of the tumor was completely different from the subdural meningioma. So uh, this is the photograph uh, 25 years ago. I removed uh, the most of the tumor from the uh, trigeminal nerve and third nerve, and, and the tumor was removed with a tentorial. However, the total removal was not possible because the tumor invaded inside the cran uh, cranial nerves and uh, very adherent. So this is after surgery. It looks like a total removal, but not because tumor in the cavernous apex was left. So the tumor here, still here. Fortunately, the, the tumor did not recur more than 10 years. However, the patient had uh, abducens palsy. And abducens palsy is almost equal to visual loss because the patient always use the eye patch. So this is a significant, significant complication even if the tumor was removed completely. So uh, recently, this is a recent case, primary cavernous sinus meningioma was treated only by a radio surgeon and uh, were controlled by gamma light. And this is the primary cavernous sinus meningioma extended into the subdural space. The patient had a visual disturbance already. And uh, I removed the subdural part only. And uh, inside the cavernous sinus, uh, the tumor was treated by gamma light. Surgery plus gamma light treatment. So uh, for Palacera meningioma, uh, so if uh, the origin is uh, intracavernous sinus, radio surgery only. If the tumor secondary invaded into the cavernous sinus, the tumor was removed surgically uh, lateral to the fifth nerve. And inside the tumor, uh, inside the fifth nerve was treated by radio surgeon. So next uh, topic is a trigeminal schwannoma. So this tumor uh, extended from uh, both sides of middle fossa and the posterior fossa. And this part of the tumor looks like an uh, invasion into the cavernous sinus, but it is not. Because the carotid artery deviated medially. So this uh, tumor invaded in, in the Merkel cave only. So this is my uh, surgical approach. Zygomatic epidural subtemporal approach. This is a modified uh, uh, Dolenz approach. So zygomatic arch was uh, incised uh, to decrease the retraction damage to the temporal role. And the access, surgical access can be made uh, so uh, from below. So this uh, epidural approach uh, did not expose the, the te temporal by cutting the perios periosteal layer only. We we could uh, uh, expose 
this uh, tumor directly, and the tumor is still covered with inner layer. And uh, this inner layer was thickened by the tumor and it separate the cavernal sinus and the tumor. So if you could uh, preserve the medial ball of the inner layer, you will not injure the carotid artery, you will not injure the abducens nerve. So preservation of inner layer is very important. So, uh, I use the, the same approach, the same approach, zymatic epidural subtemporal approach. So benefit of this approach is no exposure and the rest, rest retraction damage to the temporal and no need to open the orbit like uh, orbitozymatic approach. By the orbitozymatic, Zygmatic approach, uh, you, you have to open the orbit. But by this approach, no need to open. This is a, a surgical view. The, this is the dura, just re reflected, not cut the dura, just reflected uh, upward. And uh, this arrow. One is a tumor covered with inner layer. Inner layer is a semi transparent fine membrane like arachnoid. So uh, it is cut and remove the tumor. So uh, if you uh, do not cut the uh, medial side of the inner layer, you will not injury the cavernal sinus, you will not open the cavernal sinus. The tumor was removed, and the orifice of the cave was widely opened by the tumor itself. So you, you, could, you can observe the pons directly and uh, uh, third nerve here, and uh, behind the basira trunk here. And this white one is a contralateral uh, oculomotor nerve. So by uh, uh, the cover of sinus wall, this is the inner layer covered by uh, ah, now this is the cavernal sinus covered by inner layer. So if you do not penetrate this membrane, you will not injury the abducens nerve. So this uh, preservation is very important. This is after operation, not only from the uh, posterior fossa, but from the Meckel cave, the tumor was gone. So this is the uh, uh, cover of sinus, still uh, preserved. And uh, no injury to the temporal row because I did not expose. So uh, no, uh, no complication. And this is a different case the dumbbell, uh, huge dumbbell myeloma compressed the brainstem and the patient had uh, ataxia. In, for such a huge tumor, I cut the tentorium. So uh, I use the zygomatic petrosal approach. This is a, a zygomatic approach plus anterior petrosal approach. So this is a surgical uh, uh, illustration, uh, <coughs> surgical uh, picture. So the zymatic arch was uh, cut and the uh, 
pyramids are apex quasi resected. So this is a combination of uh, zygomatic approach and anterior petrosal approach. And the, and the tentorium was cut to confirm the uh, neurobastral st structures in the posterior fossa. And this is after removal, so you could uh, find the total overview. And this is after surgery. The cavernous sinus is not open and still preserved here. And uh, the brainstem came back to the normal configuration. Of course, that patient had uh, no abducens palsy. And uh, this is a 26 years unmarried uh, female. The tumor extended in three fossas, infratemporal fossa, middle fossa, and the posterior fossa. So the key point is what it is. This is the petrous apex. So by removing this petrous apex, you can come into the three fossils. So a key point is remove the petrous apex. All the tumor was gone and the patient had no abducens palsy. So uh, my conclusion, uh, do not choose radio surgery for trigeminal neurinomas. It can be removed completely with minimal surgical complication if you understand the meningeal anatomy. This is the third tumor, hemangioma. So this is the interstitial type hemangioma because uh, by gadolinium uh, enhancement, uh, it presented in homogeneous uh, uh, content. This is the interstitial type. However, in this case, the uh, tumor has a homogeneous content. This is a cavernous, sinus, uh, cavernous type uh, hemangioma. And on angiograms, sometimes you can find the bending uh, <coughs> of the trunk. So this is the feeding artery. So for interstitial type, the surgery must be made by piece, uh, can be made uh, by piecemeal fashion. And for the cavernous, cavernous type, unblocked resection must be made because by piecemeal fashion, huge bleeding occurs from the tumor. So this is the uh, one example of uh, uh, cavernous type uh, hemangioma. The patient had uh, severe memory disturbance because the temporal lobe was compressed. So I decided uh, operation. In the past, uh, we, we made the parking uh, access through the Parkinson triangle. Parkinson approach was uh, made, but uh, after uh, 1995, I used the epidural subtemporal approach. So uh, by zygomatic epidural uh, temporal polar approach, we could uh, access to the tumor epidurally this was uh, reported by uh, Dolan's uh, primary. But uh, uh, I modified by combination of zygomatic uh, osteotomy to reduce the retraction damage to the temporal. So however, this is a very, very bloody operation. Uh, so clear operation is not possible 
So I presented uh, zygmatic osteotomy was made and I access to the tumor epidurally. And uh, this is the meningo hypophysial trunk coagulated. And uh, by retraction of the tumor, the compressed uh, cavernous sinus was reopened. So by this is the tumor removed and uh, the severe venous bleeding occurred after this. So you must uh, insert the third cell and the tumor lumen is covered with uh, fat. So this is a very bloody operation. So this is the after surgery, the tumor was uh, mostly gone. A uh, small remnant here. Because uh, uh, the, by, under the severe bleeding, I could not confirm the abducens nerve. So the, the patient had uh, abducens palsy. And this uh, uh, complication was uh, very negative for the patient. So if patient has a preoperative visual loss or double vision, the surgery can be indicated. If the patient has no symptom, do not operate, but the treated by gamma light. Uh, I recommended gamma light. This is the last tumor, chordoma. Cordoma uh, originate from the epidural space and uh, push the uh, pedios uh, superiorly and invade into the uh, cavern sinus. And if the dura was torn, uh, it invade the posterior fossa. So uh, this operation was made in 1999. So uh, this is the epidural subtemporal approach. And the tumor was uh, exposed between V2 and V3. Maybe uh, uh, by recent uh, technique, this tumor may be exposed by uh, endonasal approach and the nasal endoscopic approach. But th this is 1999 and the posterior fossa uh, was, posterior tumor was exposed by the section of the petrous apex here. And I uh, suction the posterior fossa tumor through the bleached uh, dura by the tumor bleached dural hole. So the uh, postural fossa tumor was gone uh, by this technique. And it looks very nice. Uh, even in the sphenoid sinus, the tumor was gone. However, three years later, this tumor recur and this tumor was reoperated. However, the rest of the tumor is still in the sphenoid sinus. And the, the, this patient died of tumor regrowth. So uh, such a tumor must be made, uh, mu must be operated by endonasal approach now. But uh, this is a, a different case regrowth after endonasal approach. So this tumor uh, invaded into the pons by uh, bleaching the uh, posterior fossa dura. So I use the anterior petrosal approach and all the tumor was removed. However, I did not stop treatment uh, after surgery 
but the total length of cleaves was irradiated by carbon ion radio surgery. And the tumor had no, no tumor regrowth. The tumor has no, no regrowth until now. So the, such a, a heavy radio surgery is very important for Cordobas. This is one example of uh, Paracera Cordoma invading into the cavernous sinus. I did not operate uh, in this case, but treated only by carbon ion radio surgery. And all the tumor was gone after radiation without any uh, cranial nerve complications. So uh, this is the recurrence free survival rate for Cordomas in our uh, university. If the uh, post-operative uh, radiation therapy was not added, only 10% of the uh, cases had uh, no free survival uh, rate, no recurrence free survival rate. 90% had uh, recurrence. And uh, uh, if uh, we added other radiations, uh, so the recurrence uh, rate was uh, uh, decreased. And uh, with the carbon ion radiation, it was the best uh, results. So uh, this is my advice. Do not over convince the surgical result for cribal cordoma surgery. They will recur if followed more than five years. So additional carbon ion or proton beam is very important after surgery to stop the tumor regrowth. If you are interested in the carbon ion radio surgery, please read uh, our papers published in 2009 in Acta Neurohirurgica. So the author was uh, our uh, young uh, colleague, Takahashi. So this is the, the last question to you. Do you know the difference between the best anatomy? Anatomy is very important, but the difference between the best anatomy and the best surgery. What is the difference? This is the answer. The best anatomy equal maximal exposure. However, the best surgery is minimal exposure by preserving meninges. Meningeal preservation is very important for the Palacera regions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Do not have so expertise here, Professor Kobayashi, Professor Goyo, Kono, Suresh. Just to, to start, I think you should divide cavernous sinus surgery in meningioma and non-meningioma are completely different, see? And the way to treat and also the results, see? And we used to do cavernous sinus meningioma surgery. You used to do radical removal. You used to have a lot of complication, especially for the eye mobility. And sometimes, you think that you remove totally the tumor, you do the MRI and post op, there is tumor in the cavernous sinus. Because that, uh, now I'm, I'm getting older and I'm learning with the masters. And I follow your philosophy, Professor Kawazi. See, I believe the cavernous sinus, you can understand 
you can do surgery, but there is patient that need, there is patient that doesn't need. I wanna bring the attention one paper from France about the natural history of a primary cavernosinus meningioma, primary. In 20%, in 15% of the case, the tumor had growth. In almost 6% the tumor, that is small one that is in the cavernous sign that the patient has no vision loss, nothing. Sometimes asymptomatic, they don't grow or grow too slow. I think the cavernous sinus era is a judgment. Not too much for surgery, not too much to razor surgery, but case by case. I give the word to Professor Kobayashi that is here to has taught, Professor Goe, Professor Suresh, and all the panelists. Thank you, sir. Wonderful presentation. The one that was done. Yes, Professor Kobayashi, your comments. Uh, and Luis, as you said, it's uh, difficult to predict uh, which is uh, malignant meningioma in the cabinet sinus, which are not. And uh, after uh, listening to uh, Dr. Almefti's uh, lecture, we have to consider the genetic uh, you know, transformation or gen uh, changes uh, in order to decide what predict to some extent what is going to be malignant in the cavernous meningioma. So this is a, a thing we have to uh, uh, <clears throat> study in the future, my impression. I'm more or less uh, uh, conservative in treating a meningioma in the cabinet sinus myself. Me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor me, Goyo. Yeah. <laughs> so it is, uh, you know. Professor what... Kobayashi was talking. Did you finish, Professor Kobayashi? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Atul, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, See, go ahead. What is, what is important, as Professor Kawase has said, that we should teach our young people people, the anatomy of the region. We should, re we should teach our younger people how to operate and how to respect the membranes and meninges. We should teach our young people how to operate in difficult areas. We cannot depend on radiation and all those things. Those, are, those come later. So unless and until we learn and we operate and we know how to operate and we know how to demolish the tumor, we know how to be safe. We know how to protect the cranial nerves. We know how to protect the blood vessels. Every tumor is different, as uh, Louis has said. Every tumor is different. And we have to develop our treatment strategy on every tumor individually. And we have to know how the tumors respect the membranes and how the surgeon has to respect the membranes during surgery. That is what Professor Kawase is saying. And of course, if we create a cranial nerve deficit, if we create a neurological deficit, that we have to learn how to prevent that deficit. So the surgery has to be done radically. Surgery has to be done radically, but safely. So these are the two things. And more and more and more and more you operate, more and more radical and more and more safe you can be. So that is what Professor Kawase is saying that you respect the anatomy, you respect the tumor membranes, and you do radical surgical resection. And then leave it to the, you know, whoever is sitting above our head in the sky, he will take the rest. Rather than depending on too much on radiation, what do you say, Louis? This is my feeling on both these earlier lectures after hearing these beautiful lectures from the Doens and from the kings of our subject, great subject of neurosurgery. Luis. Yeah, and I'll give the word to Dr. Suresh first, yeah. after okay. I can okay. say something. Uh, so, uh, another great lecture, Professor Kawase, you told us about four tumors which can involve the cavernous sinus, meningioma, trigeminal schwannoma, extracerebral hemangioma, the cavernous sinus, and lastly, cordoma, chondrosarcoma, and describe in detail the relationship of meninges to these tumors. I have some few questions. You know, true cavernous sinus hemangioma, as you told, is which will appear very bright or detuvated image, is difficult to remove. And do you, do you consider 
them subjecting to ra radiation, gamma ray, because they respond very well, uh, rather than uh, going for a big surgery. First question. Do you do diffusion tensor imaging for uh, uh, trigeminal schwannomas, the Meckel's cave schwannomas, to see sometimes rarely the trigeminal fibers are displaced medially? And what are your uh, indications for a trans pterygoid approach in those cases to re remove this Meckel's cave schwannoma? And lastly, we know that chordoma, chondrosarcomas are totally extradural tumor. Your thoughts on uh, endoscopic approach? Professor Kawazi. Professor, yeah. Professor yeah. Kawazi. Uh, so recently, the chordoma uh, is uh, uh, treated by endoscopic surgery. Uh, so I think the endoscopic approach is ideal for the chordoma. Uh, but uh, in the case of subdural invasion, uh, do not uh, consider the endoscopic surgery only by combination of uh, endoscopic approach and the transcranial approach, the tumor, the, uh, the surgery will be safer uh, because the uh, cerebral spinal fluid leakage is the major complication by endoscopic, endoscopic approach. Or the, uh, if you have to create the large the uh, defect of the dura, you must choose the endoscopic approach and combined with transcranial approach. This is my advice. Well, what, what about radiation for cavernous sinus hemangioma? Oh, uh, hemangioma. Uh, I have uh, no experience of uh, radio surgery, but uh, on the paper, the, uh, the radiation was very effective for hemangioma. So the, for the middle size hemangioma, the radiation uh, is recommended. Radio surgery is recommended. And lastly, one more question I ask. Let's say if diffusion tensor imaging of a Meckel's cave schwannoma, if it shows uh, the trigeminal fibers are displaced medially, do you advocate a trans pterygoid approach? Oh, yeah. Trans pterygoid approach. Endoscope. Yeah. Transterigoid approach for a Meckel's cave schwannoma. Meckel's cave schwannoma. Yeah. Uh, uh, you are uh, master of, uh, uh, you know, we know transcranial approaches, but what are your thoughts on endoscopic transterigoid approach? Yeah, yeah. It is uh, so uh, on the way to develop the yeah. endoscopic approach now. So I uh, cannot uh, uh, advise uh, very well about the endoscopic approach. But I, I suppose if the tumor locate lateral to the carotid artery, the, I think the transcranial approach may be better. Yeah? Uh, uh, because uh, if the uh, macular cave is open, the CSF leakage may be the major complication. So I recommend uh, the transcranial approach for, for the uh, so or dumbbell shape uh, uh, dumbbell shape uh, trigeminal swallow. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kawazi. Thank you, thank you very much. Do you know prof Professor Kawazi concept are so clear, <laughs> easy to understand <laughs> that is easy to, to follow. See the difference between the meningioma that is arising from the cavernous sinus or coming from outside. Because the great majority of the paper that you see about cavernous sinus meningioma are not cavernous sinus meningioma, are Meckel's cave meningioma. See, that you can remove coming from outside to inside. It is very interesting. And the other thing that is difficult to understand that the tumor that like the geminal shono that's coming out here you coming from the nose, it's in the lateral wall. You see, see? It, it's like you have something here and you come from here, see? It's different, see? I remember when I was in the medical, in the residency, when in the, in the, in the late eighties, in the start nineties, when they started skull base surgery. 
Professor Gore already was a professor that time. <laughs> the, the incision start here and finish here. 12 hours approach. See? And when I rise the tumor, couldn't remove. Now, I think there is, you are not get the balance yet between microsurgery and endoscopic. Today, the endoscopic, they are pushing a lot. They will find a way. It's a matter of time. You see, pituitary now is changing, cordoma is wonderful, but maybe you are pushing too much. Maybe when you have the, the carotid artery injury from the nose, try to reach the tumor, they start mm. to change their mind. When they see the, the, the rate of complication, they start to change their mind. It's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. In the, the, the concept, in the experience of Professor Kawazi today in the Caverna of Science show, real, the way to do it. The mangioma is very interesting because the surgery is not easy, <laughs> as Professor Kawazi showed. It's a very blood surgery. And sometimes you see the results from the gamma knife, the tumor disappear. Look at like this moment in mangioma, Professor. They give gamma knife and the tumor disappear. I don't know if in the future tumor will come back. I don't know if the future will have radiation induce meningioma. I don't know if there is some transformation in the future. Mm. But what you, you see if radiation therapy for skull-based lesions, for example, in schwannoma, vestibular schwannoma, the tumor shrink, does not disappear, but shrink. Maybe you have a radiation induced meningioma, but in meningioma, you don't see this. Looks like the same image. Sometimes decrease a little bit, 10%, 15%, 20%, and after come back. See, for hemangioma, radiation guy disappear the tumor. See, I'm not sure, uh, 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 maybe Dr. Go, Professor Kobayashi has a lot of experience in Professor Kawaii say, we are still trying to find the balance. Endoscopy, microsurgery, radio surgery, in one more player, the natural history of some of these disease. I think we have more players coming to the game in the time that you can get the answer when see the best for the patient. I don't know, I talk too much. <laughs> Professor Haja, we have Professor Kono here that is. Yeah. Professor Kono is, one of the greatest acoustic neuroma surgeon in the world, maybe the greatest. <laughs> uh, thank, uh, thank you for your excellent and uh, educational uh, lecture, Professor Kawase. And uh, I totally agree uh, with your policy uh, that uh, for small or middle-sized uh, trigeminal schwannoma, uh, we don't have to cut in the mm. middle for uh, dura. Uh, Super petrosinus uh, tentorium. But uh, for large uh, trigeminal schwannoma, we can uh, have the option to cutting the uh, so tentorium. Uh, I, I agree. But uh, so you mentioned uh, uh, trigeminal schwannoma, uh, uh, you classified, categorized into the interdural uh, tumor. But uh, so uh, actually, so you, you, you mentioned about the wide uh, concept, I think. And uh, uh, most of, I think, most of the uh, intramecular cave uh, schwannoma is the subdural uh, tumor, I, I think. So, uh, so uh, we, we should call them. Uh, most of the trigeminal schwannoma is a uh, uh, subdural uh, tumor, I, in my uh, understanding. Is it correct? Uh, of course, uh, the postural fossa part is a subdural tumor. Yes. So, uh, anterior to the orifice of Michael K, mm -hmm. it is the interdural part. Ah, so, uh, so, so. <laughs> really? Yeah, so. Mm. <clears throat> Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor.
corner for that question. I think it's high time uh, we wind this up. Now, officially, I would like to go back to our chair, Professor Luis Berba, to hear his final comments. I think should give the word to Professor Kawazi. <laughs> 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 Please, Professor Kawazi. Okay. You can do the final remarks for, for uh, Okay. okay. <laughs> We have the great uh, honor uh, to have uh, you here. That's what uh, so today's lecture. Uh, uh, so it is my pleasure to, to contribute to the younger generation. Uh, and uh, uh, my talking may, be, uh, uh, may have some advancement, technical advancement to the younger generation, I hope. So uh, thank you for your invitation. To this lecture. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can hear from Professor Kobayashi as well. Kobayashi. Professor Kobayashi. Uh, if I may add something uh, more, I would like to stress again after uh, listening to Professor Kawasaki's uh, talk uh, the importance of anatomy. You know, well, he has always been trying to delineate the relation between normal structure and the pathology. And uh, I'm sure it is right, but you know nobody can be sure. Yet I think uh, he proposed the uh, importance of this anatomical consideration to any surgery, especially in that vision of the cavernous sinus. I think you have made a great contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. I think it's now time we can wind this up officially. A special thanks to Professor uh, Osama al Mefti, Professor Kawase, and the chairs, Professor Kobayashi, and Professor Luis Baba. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President of the ACNS, I would like to express our gratitude for your time and support for the ACNS. A special thanks to the great faculties who joined us today Professor Atul Girl, Professor Suresh Nair, Professor Kono, and other distinguished guests from India, as well as abroad. Thank you so much. I'd like to mention that this is the first webinar in the series of our anniversary edition of webinars, and we'll have great lectures ahead till the uh, end of June. I request everybody to join us. A big thanks to my co-host, Dr. Luke Gun Singh, for chipping in today and supporting us. So until we all meet on the 5th of June, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much.